well yes sir okay it's audible sir okay Rahul, uh, Mr. Maya Krishnan, a 40-year-old male from Tiruvannamalai, Chennai, uh, from class three socio-economic class, uh, who is vendor by occupation, came with chief complaints of vomiting for past three months and abdomen pain for uh, past three months. Uh, history of presenting illness. The patient was apparently normal before three months, after which he had a history of vomiting, uh, which was three uh, three to four episodes per day. Initially, vomiting was uh, one to two hours after food intake. Later, it uh, progressed. Uh, uh, uh later uh, the vomiting came uh, came soon after, uh, soon after food intake a uh, vomitus contains partially digested food particles it was non projectile and non bilious also and it was non blood stained uh history of abdomen pain it was in serious in onset progressively can increased you go back one pain. slide kana setu go uh, back one slide for a moment okay sir okay sir um, i think okay go ahead okay Uh, history of abdomen pain. It was in serious in onset. Uh, it was progressively increased to reach a plateau. It was dull aching pain, localized to to to, to upper abdomen region. Uh, continuous in nature. There was no periodicity. It was not radiating, and there was no any aggravating and relieving factors. Uh, history of sensation of abdomen fullness for past three months, and he has a history of weight loss for past three months and loss of appetite for past three months. Uh, history of constipation. Uh, 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 was there and passing stools once every three to four days for uh, past two months. There was uh, no history of hematemesis and no history of melina, no history of abdomen uh, abnormal bladder habits, uh, <coughs> no history of cough with hem uh, uh, hemoptysis, no history of yellowish discoloration of eyes or skin, no history of seizures and mental disorientation, no history of bone pain, no history of fever, no history of uh, swelling in, uh, anywhere in the body. Uh, so, Shailesh Basit. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, uh, finish history. the history part, then we will come back for discussion. Okay, sir. Past history, there was uh, no history of dyspepsic symptoms in the past. A patient is a known case of pulmonary tuberculosis. Treated at Chinda Dripe Chigach. Completed ten months of ATT three months back. The, he was not a known case of diabetes mellitus, uh, hypertension, asthma, epilepsy, HIV, and cardiovascular disorders. No history of any previous gastric reconstruction surgeries. a uh, personal history uh, he was a non vegetarian diet consumer impaired food intake for past 3 months increased thirst for uh, thirst for past 3 months uh, he was smoker for past 15 years 10 cigarettes per day uh, a chronic alcoholic for uh, past 15 years 180 ml of brandy every day family history there was no similar complaints among the family members and uh, there was no history of uh, cancer or cancer related deaths in the family Uh, treatment history: Patient is a known case of pulmonary tuberculosis. Treated at Chinda Dripe Chigach. Completed 10 months of ATT for three months back. Uh, no records of previous hospitalization available. Uh, not known. Uh, not known to any. Uh, not known as allergic to any food or drugs. Uh, summary: A 40-year-old male who was a chronic smoker and alcoholic presented with the complaints of non-bilious, uh, non-blood-stained uh, vomiting, containing partially digested food particles. Uh, dull, uh, the, uh, he has pain, uh, dull aching, continuous non-periodic upper abdomen pain uh, with associated abdomen fullness, constipation, loss of weight and loss of appetite. Uh, with the above history, I su suspect a case of gastric outlet obstruction. Okay. Um, Seetu, with uh, so much of points. uh can you now would like to uh, tell me what would be the possible cause for your uh, patient who to present with the gastric outlet obstruction uh, sir the possible causes could be uh, uh, sir uh, there are uh, several causes for gastric outlet obstruction sir uh, okay. uh, uh, ulcer uh, cicatrized okay. uh, duodenal ulcer um, uh, gastric sorry uh, uh, gastric carcinoma uh, mm -hmm. uh, Carcinoma of pancreas that compresses the duodenum, so it may also cause a gastric outlet obstruction. With the given history, uh, he's a known. Uh, uh, he was a chronic smoker and alcoholic, sir. Mm -hmm. So that itself uh, predisposes him to get uh, 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 cancer. I, I mean, gastric outlet. Can uh, is it not a predisposing factor for acid peptide? Uh, yes, sir. That also. Smoking and alcohol. Uh, uh, 
uh, yes, sir, uh, that's an uh, predisposing factor for uh, uh, peptic ulcer disease also. But uh, mm -hmm. in, in case of peptic ulcer disease, uh, uh, there will be periodicity of pain. But uh, in this case, he has uh, continuous dull aching pain and there was no any, any aggravating or leaving factor. Uh, whereas in uh, peptic so, ulcer disease, uh, what do you uh, What do you mean by periodicity of pain? Sir, a periodicity, periodicity means uh, in case of ulcer, he'll be having pain for uh, two to three weeks and uh, there'll be no uh, pain or uh, any burning sensation for two to six months. So, there will be a period of remission of pain uh, in this case. Uh, yes, sir. Right. Uh, How uh, do you differentiate? See, where all ulcers can come? Uh, sir, ulcers? Ulcers, ulcers can come anywhere in the stomach, sir. Okay. Beyond stomach, where all it can come? Beyond stomach, duodenum. Which part of the duodenum is more common? Uh, sir, uh, antrum. Talking about duodenum, can uh, uh, Sir, uh, duodenum. First part of duodenum. How many parts of duodenum are there? Uh, four parts of duodenum. Okay. Of which, which part is more prone for ulceration? Uh, sir, uh, second part of duodenum. Usually D1, D2 junction or predominantly in the bulb. Okay. okay. So okay. technically, if you say D1 and the proximal D2 is the right answer, or even if you say D1, the examiners will agree. All okay. right. Then okay. if you go to the next point, which part of the duodenum is more prone for ulceration in the D1? Which part is more prone for ulceration? It's anterior. So, usually it is a post bulbar ulcer or bulbar ulcer, right? So, okay. ulcers can be single, ulcers can be multiple, ulcers can be located in the anterior wall, ulcers can be located in the posterior wall, okay. and it can be in the replacing the entire bulb. Is okay. there any definition for large ulcer and short ulcer? Sir, uh, if it is great, uh, greater than 2 millimeters, then we call it a giant ulcer, sir. More than 10 millimeter, not more than 2 millimeter, should be okay. more than 10 millimeter. All right. Okay. So, with that in place, now we move on to the next important thing. Uh, how do you differentiate between gastric ulcer and duodenal ulcer? Uh, sir, a uh, gastric ulcer. Um, uh, with gastric ulcer, uh, the patient complains of uh, pain uh, following uh, food intake. Whereas in duodenal ulcer, he says uh, he'll be relieved by uh, he'll be relieved uh, from pain after uh, taking food, and uh, vomiting. Uh, uh, no, no, don't vomiting. jump into vomiting now. Let us not jump into vomiting. Let us limit to the pain. Okay. See, in a gastric ulcer pain worsens on taking food. Okay. Duodenal ulcer pain is relieved on taking food. Okay. Why do you think you said this answer? So why do you think this uh, this happening? Uh, sir, uh, in duodenal ulcer, uh, the main uh, thing is uh, due to increased acid secretion, sir. Okay. So that uh, when we take uh, more food, uh, acid will uh, act on it. So uh, that'll be product of... Uh, so the pH uh, will go stomach. up. So oh, yes, pH sir. will go up moment food is given to the stomach for the food digest. Yes, All right. So which part of the stomach secretes acid? body mm -hmm. it is in the antrum all right body has few glands but predominantly in the antrum so which part gives what are the stimulus for the acid secretion so gastrin no first the common things common presence of food in the stomach stomach okay. presence of carbohydrates and proteins or fat whatever presence of food in the stomach is the most important triggering factor okay. then second comes in presence of incriminating factors like smoking presence of alcohol death and all those things are also potential stimulant and when you are sitting for the exams like this then it is a potential stimulant and we are going to face a viva oc or when you are going to appear for theory exams then it is all potential stimulant for acid secretion so anxiety sleeplessness pressure to perform all these things are they have different pathways now we will go pathway one by one. You said one important hormone, which is essential for the pathway of secretion of acid. So where is that hormone secreted in the stomach? You said gastrin, right? Yes, sir. Yes, gastrin is an important hormone which it, uh, drives the acid acid pump. So where, which part of the stomach is gastrin secreted? 
hello hello sir we're busy no sir what answer to someone you finished that i can wait no sir it's okay it's okay sir so which part of the stomach secretes gastrin so i would say your friends can also answer this is not an exam this is a teaching program so others can also help them to answer okay anyone else so in the antrum no please understand the question is very different secretory part of acid is from the antrum i am talking about gastrin secretion fundus fundus sir. very good very good fundus excellent excellent very good both of you so fundus has the gastrin precursor or gastrin secreting gland so is gastrin secreted as such or it is secreted as the proform proform so what is the proform called anyone else want to take this question no sir is there anything called pro gastrin or pre pro gastrin so you have studied in physiology no can you tell the sequence of acid secretion one by one step by step anyone can help him no problem you should be definitely aware i will briefly tell you so the stimulus of food in the stomach is a potential uh, function then you have there is a vagal nuclei in the brain where is the vagal nuclei you know area post trema yes sir where is the area post trema medulla the midbrain and the medulla oblongata junction area post trema is the vomiting center above which is the vagal nuclei which cranial nerve is vagal nerve Tenth. How many vagal nerve? Oh, very good. Somebody answered right. Very tenth. good. Tenth. Which cranial nerve is that? Tenth. Tenth nerve. Very good. So tenth cranial nerve, tenth nerve nucleus is there above. So the visual stimulus. When you are very hungry, when then olfactory stimulus. So both the things can be a stimulus. You are very hungry. You have nice fragrant from a nearby restaurant. Then you get acid secreted. Then again you see nice tasty food. then you get your acid secret these are all centrally controlled mechanisms then as you come down then once the mere presence of the food stimulates the pro gastrin becomes gastrin gastrin activates the sodium potassium atpase pump so sodium potassium atpase pump what really happens the hydrogen part and the chloride part gets actively secreted from the basal cells of the gastric foveolus so what really happens you have the villar architecture of the stomach so they start secreting and the sodium potassium atpase is a active uh, pump which secretes the hydrogen ion which is a proton positive energy proton and chloride which is a negative energy cation to get secreted and once they are separately hydrogen and chloride are separately made they get fused and once they are available it becomes hydrochloric acid which is secreted into the stomach and then there are many rate limiting steps the most important drugs which are working on the rate limiting steps are what i am talking is the proton pump the hydrogen h plus so when you use your omeprazole and pantoprazole they are called proton pump inhibitors then there is something called histamine receptors histamine receptors again are the rate limiting step which are essential for the smooth functioning of the sodium potassium atpase pump so it is before the sodium potassium atpase pump your histamine receptors work which type of histamine receptors work the h2, h2. so the histamine 2 type of receptor pump works and what drugs work on the h2 receptors in controlling the acid ranitidin famotidin very good so famotidin group and the ranitidin group are the principal drugs which are working on the h2 receptor antagonist so is there any drug which can control the gastrin secretion see gastrin is the precursor for acid formation right can someone stop the gastrin to secrete anybody would like to take the question 
can i you can momentarily stop sharing the screen mark so that i can see you guys yes so now you tell me what are the uh, drugs which can stop the secretion of gastrin think about it some drug which can stop the secretion of gastrin have you heard about octreotide yes sir somatostatin oh, octreotide is the drug which can stop or block the secretion of gastrin all right so these are the principal ways where you can handle the gastrin pump okay now we move on to your case as such uh, you go to the first slide now you are in the hostel kana no sir in my home sir at home okay go to the first slide okay so now we go on to little bit more about the pain we discussed about the ulcer pain what is the difference between ulcer pain and gastric cancer pain uh, sir you said one pain. loss of periodicity yes then yes, it will be an ulcer it will be like burning sensation sir uh, in a uh, okay. uh, uh, carcinoma it will be dull aching pain dull aching or nagging pain that's the right way to tell that and then most importantly Where, where are what are the causes of pain in malignancy? Here, acid secretes, mucosa gets eroded, the enteric and myenteric fibers are exposed. So that's how you get pain in normal erosions and ulcers, acid ulcers. How do you get pain in the gastric malignancy? Uh, sir, uh, uh, the carcinoma can infiltrate the walls of stomach, uh, thereby it okay. may affect the mesenteric and myenteric. So infiltrate the nerves and they can give pain. Next. Or, uh, it causes distension sir so that uh, gastric distension can cause pain yes. yes usually the gastric distension can be because of acid peptic disease or the gastric cancer distal stomach cancer yes. but then which which happens very slowly ulcer obstruction or tumor obstruction sir tumor obstruction which happens very slowly ulcer yeah. obstruction very good very good so when it is happening slowly the stomach also accommodates most of the time the gastric distension which is following an acid peptic disease is not at all painful whereas when it happens in a random way tumor grows very fast and the block is very complete so then you have sometimes gastric distension can give pain but in general stomach has a remarkable capacity it gives out of a discomfort than pain when they get distended now we move on to little more about pain what happens if there is a where is the obstruction located if it is a duodenal ulcer in the stomach and duodenum which part of the duodenum or which part of the stomach sir uh, in case of uh, carcinoma it uh, usually occurs uh, uh, in the distal part of stomach sir otherwise called antro pyloric zone right predominantly antral predominance and less of pylorus in ulcer disease sir uh, in ulcer in case of gastric ulcer it occurs in the lesser uh, along the lesser curvature sir otherwise called incisura right incisura is the most common thing let us not come into jump into it let us talk about duodenal ulcer causing obstruction in this patient we will discuss so it will be mostly more of duodenum and less of pylorus or pyloro duodenal is the duodenal ulcer causing obstruction if it is malignancy it is usually antro pylorus predominantly in atrium less of pylorus all right so the obstruction is more proximal in cancer more distal on to the duodenum in ulcer disease all right so that is the location of the obstruction then when you have the tumor in the antrum the tumor is tumor can be where all tumor can occur it happens in the mucosa to start with then it goes to the what are the layers of the gastric wall uh, sir uh, mucosa submucosa and serosa mucosa still has epithelium uh, uh, no no no, no. wait wait go slow you have mucosa then what happens submucosa is there then what is there 
uh, muscularis externa and zero sum ah you never told that you went to the zero sum first no worries no worries come so you have layer by layer penetration of the tumor starts from the mucosal cells then it invades the submucosa externa media and interna then crosses the zero sum when it crosses the posterior wall of the stomach what is a nearby organ which is there next to the stomach along the posterior aspect pancreas very good so pancreas can be involved by the tumor or medically we call antral tumor infiltrating into the head of the pancreas so a patient who gets more and more pain can indicate the tumor is growing faster or tumor is getting advanced so when the pain periodicity is lost and the pain is persistent so patient tells sir i have severe back pain then you have to be much worried because it is possibly the advanced stage tumor infiltrating into the pancreas and causing persistent pain so the pancreatic uh, attachment can be abutment of the tumor infiltration of the capsule then infiltration of the parenchyma these are the three types of involvement of pancreas if exam somebody asks what are the types of involvement it is abutment infiltration of the capsule then infiltration of the parenchyma once it crosses beyond the capsule it becomes more painful for the patient right this is about the pain then when the tumor is very advanced if it is blocks the biliary outflow or blocks the common bile duct common bile duct block can be directly because of the tumor or it can be because of the nodal tissue which is blocking the bile duct then also you can have very severe pain which is on the right upper quadrant or it will be more of a biliary pain these are the two common things to have pain and then when the tumor is fairly advanced otherwise what you call metastatic gastric cancer you have peritoneum you have the posterior root of mesentery involvement you have the left gastric or parietic zone involvement then also you get severe pain but those pains are very advanced generally they are all terminal pain these are about the pain following the gastric cancer all right now go to the next slide okay now you please let me know what is the type of vomiting which is very typical in gastric outer tract obstruction you have mentioned most of these factors one important factor which you missed out you want to try it again try your luck again or someone you want to add up to him what is the type of uh, vomit which happens in gastric outer tract obstruction you have mentioned most of the things whether the vomiting is spontaneous or whether the vomiting is induced vomiting that is the most important factor right spontaneous so, here in this case it is spontaneous is it yes sir okay this is a real case or a virtual case sir a virtual case sir okay so most of the time you will be having a induced vomiting what really happens is unless the patient has some form of irritation to the mucosa they may not be able to vomit the food stays and stays and stays and stays the stomach gets distended to a huge level sometimes your stomach can be felt just above the pubic bones also so much stomach can distended patient wants to get relieved from the discomfort because of the gross stretch of the stomach they put two fingers into their mouth stimulate the pharyngeal posterior pharyngeal wall and they induce vomit that's a very typical finding of the gastric outer tract obstruction patient always put in a finger to vomit to produce induced vomiting that is a very typical finding of the gastric outer tract obstruction when do you have projectile vomiting in case of pyloric stenosis so it common in children infantile hypertrophic pyloric stenosis so it comes out like a jet so at stomach fills up and one time it throws up the child will be putting out the content like a fountain through the mouth that's why it's called projectile vomiting okay here you have mentioned the vomiting is non bilious so is that indicative of something towards the diagnosis Uh, sir uh, when the obstruction is distal to the second part of duodenum uh, the vomiting will be uh, bilious sir 
uh, here the obstruction is probably uh, uh, in front of uh, proximal to the second part of the duodenum very good so which is more commonly suggestive of uh, obstruction in stomach gastric due to due to gastric malignancy very good so it can be predominantly due to anthropyloric malignancy and the growth or obstruction is above the entry of the ampulla in medial wall of the d2 all right okay then not blood stain what do you infer out of it where all bleeding can happen in your case in gastric outlet obstruction where all blood can come out sir uh, from the tumor itself sir okay from the tumor yes uh, then so the tumor uh, may erode the vessels of stomach see there can be mucosal breach and you can have bleed it what you say is all very terminal stage you don't get the patient to live through when the patient has to bleed eroding a artery or a terminal phase only it is we are much worried on something something called mallory v syndrome what is mallory v syndrome uh, sir uh, the longitudinal tear at the lower end of esophagus very uh, good which happens because of forced vomiting so when there is very strong retching and the patient is not able to vomit easily they put very large effort to vomit then mallory v tear happens so the tear can be in the lower end of this esophagus or it can even extend into the little bit towards the fundic side so as long as it is superficial it stops well sometimes it can involve the muscularis layer also when it goes that deep it becomes profusely bloody and they start vomiting all right okay. so these okay. are the typical finding where you can have blood vomiting all right so okay. now you move to the next slide pain we have discussed go to the next slide okay can we discuss little more about it can you tell what is the sensation of abdominal fullness why does it happen Uh, sir, uh, because uh, abdominal fullness, uh, there isn't some uh, uh, obstruction at the distal part of stomach, sir. So he always okay. feels uh, that the stomach is full, even though he do not eat. A better way to tell is early satiety. <laughs> Patient does not have any appetite, so loss of appetite is there. Okay. Early satiety is without even taking food, they always feel full. That is okay. a very typical right word to tell. history of early satiety which is present okay. the sensation of abdominal fullness indicates the food is staying in the stomach for a longer time and they are not able to pass beyond then what is your fourth point history of constipation why do you want to ask that history uh, sir because the obstruction uh, do not uh, let the food particles to pass beyond uh, uh, that point sir so he may have uh, he may present with constipation so it is called low residue constipation because there is no residue which is going beyond the stomach there is nothing left behind initially there will be blocked to the solids then later as it becomes more and more complete patient will get blocked to the liquids also so once little bit of liquid food is going then patient may have pellety stools how sheeps and goats pass no that will be very typical of these patients patients will tell i pass very little motion it comes on pellet comes out in pellets that's what they normally say so what is the definition differentiation between obstipation and constipation uh, sir obstipation uh, uh, he uh, not even uh, pass uh, flat uh, sir okay so obstipation uh, is not passing flatus constipation pass. is not pa passing stools all right so what does obstipation okay. indicate intestinal okay. obstruction very good which part of the intestine gets obstructed you get obstipation small intestine or large intestine predominantly large intestine and less of small intestine very good very good so when there is little bit of large intestine left also some amount of air can pass out after the obstruction but if it is lower left sided colon obstruction gives more of a obstipation and when the patient presents very late even small bowel can present with obstipation very good very good then you told about history of hematemesis which we discussed what is the history of melina what is melina a uh, blood in stools 
blood in stools is not melina no blood in stools is bleeding per rectum or stool mixed with blood you have melina is a specific term blood in stools yes blood offensive smelly sticky black tarry stools this is the typical definition of melina can somebody tell what is the mechanism of melina why how come blood becomes black in the motion Nothing. You are good. You are right. Hemorrhage. So there is a J hemorrhage. After that, what happens? Hematin will be formed. Hematin. How does it form? Blood will get oxidized. How does it get oxidized? It takes longer time to travel. So that is one. That is a slow transit. the blood takes a longer time because there is no food residue it can get oxidized or the acid in the stomach can produce acid hematin eventually become more and more oxidation happens then eventually becomes black and along with the enteral content whatever the food they have taken it becomes black tarry offensive stools all right what is offensive it gives a very typical smell How many of you have seen a melanic stool? Have any one of you seen? Yes or no? No, sir. Nobody has seen. So you can see today. Watch your Google. All of you are having phones. You just see what is melanic stool, right? And once somebody in your PG or someone ask them to keep you informed whenever there is a patient who has a melanic stool, you can tell even before entering the patient's room. before even 10 foot or 15 foot melanic stool as a offensive order where by experience you will be able to tell no no this patient is having melina okay now i have a question to you at what level of bleeding if it happens in the gi tract one can happen or one can call it as a melina 40 to 60 ml lower intestine bleeding tract how do you different uh, can i uh, i think who spoke akshay is it who spoke who was the other person who spoke along with you setu oh, sir uh, don't know sir thoughtle you don't know who is that person can you tell somebody wanted to answer sir upper ji usually presents with blood stain vomiting lower ji hemorrhage only presents with uh, melina and uh, No, upper J also can present as melina. It is not. See, the point is, the blood bleeding which happens above the ligament of trites. Where is the ligament of trites? Anybody the wants to take this person? Where is the ligament of trites? Somebody told the answer. Correct. Where is it? Which part of duodenum? Fourth part of duodenum. otherwise call the junction of the duodenum or jejunum so when you go to the operating theater next time to watch an operation you ask your assistant professor or your pgs to show where is the ligament of trites so ligament of the trites is the one which differentiates or which is the limiting factor between the small bowel and or duodenum and the jejunum so any bleeding which is happening above the ligament of trites then generally they become darker because it takes a longer transit time it has a higher chance of exposure of acid hematin so it becomes more darker can uh, bleeding from the right colon become melanic bleeding from the small bowel can it become melanic yes or no yes sir how does it happen you are correct your answer is perfectly correct so how does it happen so when the bleed is very very slow right what are the types of bleeding in rect in in uh, large intestine and the stools called occult bleeding when do you call it as occult bleeding when no. it is not visual to eyes overt bleeding overt bleeding is visibly seeing blood in the stool is overt bleeding what is obscure bleeding somebody wants to help setu 
obscure bleeding is you have a physically seen bleeding but you do not know the source of the bleeding that is called obscure gi bleed right and then you have massive hematemesis and massive melina so when they have more than stool when the blood volume is more rather than the stool volume sometimes patient may have only clots and melina together big volume or in other words the volume of the bleeding causes hemodynamic compromise patient may have tachycardia patient may have systolic fall in bp or patient can have symptoms of shock these are all called the large loss of blood or massive hematemesis or massive melina these are the fundamental definition you should be aware of all right okay. so for you to show a typical radiological ct guidance or any test to show a bleeding the bleeding should be 1 ml per minute and above yeah. so if you want to do an angiogram or want to do something to find out the bleeding should be minimum of 1 ml per minute for them to be radiologically identified all right so okay. these are the things you should have in mind whenever you have what is the important uh, test to do if there is occult blood what is the test called Okay. somebody wants to help him so cot test cot test cot test is otherwise called occult fetal fecal blood test fecal blood test or goyak test goyak is a plant or a tree which uh, gives that so once the goyak is turned it turns more colored or it can turn purple on exposure of this stool to the the occult uh, stool with occult blood when it is exposed to the goyak cot it turns color to purple all right so if you don't if you don't have access to fecal card or goyak test what is the other methodology to find out so if you take a little bit of stool and keep it in a wet mount in a microscope then you can see rbcs all right or even you can apply a little bit of eosinophil and hematoxylin that also can visualize presence of rbcs normally stools does not contain rbcs but if there are plenty of rbcs which need not be seen in our physical eye or microscopically that is indicative and confirmatory of occult blood okay go ahead the next slide so typically these patients can present with anemia so how do you get anemia the tumor is trickling out little bit of rbcs every day for 2 to 3 months patient can become anemic patient need not be having you may say patient does not give history of bleeding or history of blood in the vomiting or blood in the stools still patient can go anemic so this is very typical of occult bleeding from the tumor all right ulcer also can give occult bleeding all right then one more point based on the location of the ulcer the presentation can also vary so if the ulcer is located in the anterior wall of the duodenum it produces duodenal ulcer perforation if the ulcer is located in the posterior wall of the duodenum it bleeds so anterior perforates posterior bleeds remember that way so anterior ulcer perforates posterior ulcer bleeds remember that way all right okay so then now why do you want to ask about cough with hemoptysis sir to rule out the metastasis uh, the tumor would have metastasis to lung uh, thereby causing cough with hemat uh, hemoptysis usually gastric tumor comes as a pleural uh, lesion causing pleural effusion that's the most common metastasis then it can be having infiltrative metastasis in the lung also or the rice called parenchymal metastasis generally bleeding is a terminal event they don't that commonly have because they are in the parenchyma once they breach the bronchiolar bronchiolar bronchial artery circulation then only it bleeds mostly they are in the terminal event generally not seen good you asked that question next why do you want to ask about lh discoloration of the eyes and skin sir to rule out liver secondaries before that uh, so jaundice see the stomach jaundice first to metastasis that. to the portal nodes so the port nodes in the lymph nodes in the porta gives compression that gives oh, jaundice okay. before that jaundice. then comes you see your liver has god has given reserve in the liver for more than 60 to 70% of liver is in excess capacity that's why we are able to donate half of the liver or even more than half of the liver so stomach 
cancer causing liver metastasis causing jaundice is a again a terminal event so it is more in the nodes in the porta causing port the biliary obstruction causing jaundice then why do you want to ask about seizures and mental disorientation sir uh, brain metastasis the most important thing is metabolic dysfunction because of the gastric outer duct obstruction brain metastasis happens again it's a terminal event what is a typical metabolic derangement in gastric outer duct obstruction uh, sir uh, hypo uh, uh, hypokalemic hypochloremic uh, metabolic alkalosis with paradoxical aciduria very good so when you have so much of uh, entire range of uh, derangement of sodium potassium chloride everything goes wrong patient can get drowsy and they can also get disoriented because of that so that is the most common thing you would like to know why do you want to ask for bone pain bone metastasis they are again very terminal event bone pain which part of the bones get involved in gastric cancer there are how, there are very parts in the bone no long bones short bones flat bones cortical bones cancellous bones where does it get involved long bones sir. typical in the marrow and the nearer to the marrow so it is called skeletal micrometastasis this is a very typical presentation of gastric cancer but then there can be obviously macrometastasis also in metastasis to the bone you have two types osteolytic type and osteoblastic type in gastric cancer you have osteolytic type of osteolytic is when you do an x ray there will be radio lucency if there is a radio density higher density which all tumors can give osteoblastic secondaries usually prostatic cancer are the one very typical example of osteoblastic secondary where if you do an x ray and see there will be more opaque or more, it will appear more whitish whereas in gastric cancer and breast cancer and all renal cancer uh, all these things you will have a punched out feel or you will have a osteolytic there will be darker than the nearby bone that is the differentiate between the osteolytic and osteoblastic secondaries okay why do you want to ask for fever here you can safely say i want to exclude covid in the current scenario so that is one way can answer but then fever is the paraneoplastic syndrome for most of the cancers so without infection also people can present with fever so it's the paraneoplastic syndrome but mostly these things are for lymphoma all those type of tumors than having in the gastric cancer all right then okay. what do you want to buy no hcf swelling anywhere in the body What is the swelling? Or you want to look in? Sister Mary, doctor. Somebody you want to answer? Tell. Sister Mary Nodel. Very good. Also, Sister Mary Joseph Nodel. Where does it happen? Around umbilicus. In uh, so, uh, how does Sister Mary Joseph Nodel happen in the umbilicus? Transylomic spread of cells. Transylomic? Will it reach umbilicus or it reaches the pelvis? Sir, uh, through. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, it reaches through the falciform ligament, ligament leading on to the remnant of the umbilicus and then <laughs> it becomes a umbilical nodule who is sister mary joseph who is one of the nurse in us who picked up these patients she then she realized when that when there is a nodule in the umbilicus it becomes advanced intraabdominal malignancy that is how it is called named after the sister who identified that so other swelling can be in the axilla in the supraclavicular fossa these are the two things which you can definitely no history of swelling under the axilla or no history of swelling in the supraclavicular or in the neck so that will be more typical when you ask that question how do you think the tumor goes to the supraclavicular zone so through the thoracic duct so when you have a tumor in the stomach the first station is the node second station next go into the celiac plexus or cisterna chylii then it ascends to the thoracic duct and what really 
happens is the tumor in the thoracic duct blocks the thoracic duct entry into the subclavian vein eventually causing back flow of the tumor cells there in the neck so it spreads to the lymph lymph glands in the neck eventually causing what is the name of the sign when there is a node in the neck trosseous sign very good the cause node or trosseous sign these are the both things you should be having fine it can be in the scalene zone it can be in the parascalene parasternomastoid supraclavicular all these can be the presence of secondaries in the neck okay. how does tumor goes to the axilla what is the node in the axilla called irish node very irish. good very good very good excellent so what do you call that how do you how does it go there so that is a homework for you all guys okay now we go through the clinical part of it go here you can always one more supportive point is this patient is recently treated for tuberculosis so when you want to tell about cough with expectoration or cough with hemoptysis you can also justify that so it, okay. it is street smartness when you want to tell something you have to apply to that particular patient sir i would like to know whether the treatment of tuberculosis is complete or no. still the disease is become resistant and they are reactivated so in presence of cancer even though you have a treated history of tuberculosis tuberculosis can get reactivated because of the immune suppressed state of the tumor so you should be able to tell that and escape out of the exam all right now you go ahead go to the clinical finding Uh, yeah. A general, a general examination. The patient is conscious, oriented, and comfortable at rest. Moderately built, poorly nourished, uh, 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 poorly nourished, and emaciated. Uh, uh, paler present. No actress. No cyanosis. No clubbing. Pedal edema or generalized lymph node nopadi. He was moderately dehydrated, sir. Uh, pulse. Uh, pulse rate eighty four per minute. Uh, no specific. Go to the abdomen, Kanna. Uh, Uh, examination yeah. of abdomen inspection uh, patient uh, sir first the concern was obtained and was examined in uh, good light uh, patient is made to lie flat on his back with uh, legs extended abdomen it was covered in uh, symmetrical on either side of the midline except for hypochondric and epigastric region all quadrants move equally with respiration uh, fullness in the left hypochondric and epigastric region skin over the abdomen normal uh, no secondary changes umbilical is in the midline uh, inverted or uh, no nodules or uh, discoloration uh, seen over the uh, umbilicus a uh, visible gastric peristalsis seen from left to right ending at the mass uh, no visible scars sinus or dilated veins uh, no visible pulsations on the anterior abdominal wall no visible intestinal peristalsis a uh, flanks free no fullness no other swellings in the abdomen hernial orifice free cough impulse negative external genitalia normal uh, on inspection of the left supraclavicular and left axillary region no swelling or fullness is seen a uh, palpation on superficial palpation no localized rise of temperature over the abdomen no tenderness abdomen soft no guarding or rigidity uh, mass is felt in the epigastric region on the deep palpation hard mass with irregular surface of size uh, 6 cross 6 cm is felt in the epigastrium extending to the left hypochondrium yeah, about 6 cm uh, below the zip sternum margins are palpable on all sides and it moves with respiration mobility restricted from side to side and not fixed to the anterior abdominal wall uh, becomes less prominent on rising and cornet uh, on cornet test non pulsatile uh, succussion splash positive uh, liver and spleen not palpable renal angle no fullness no palpable nodules surround umbilicus uh, no palpable lymph node over the left uh, supraclavicular or left axillary region uh, percussion dullness not over the abdomen uh, liver span normal band of resonance is heard uh, between the swelling and the liver dullness or uh, no shifting dullness no fluid thrill auscultation auscultos scraping uh, greater curvature of stomach extends uh, inferiorly uh, sorry it, uh, it's below the umbilicus uh, digital rectal examination after explaining the procedure to the patient concern was obtained perianal region normal no fissures sphincter tone normal no prostate enlargement no bleeding no deposits in the rectal vesicle pouch the examination of what the next slide the diagnosis gastric outlet obstruction with features of carcinoma stomach okay can we go to the inspection slide again okay next slide see here 
you have to be careful in identifying something see what is that you want to say you are going to tell it is a mass and gastric outlet obstruction so here when you go when you see the slide you are mentioning a very briefly about the mass the visible gastric peristalsis is seen from left to right ending at the mass so then you should have quantified the mass first before starting the gastric outlet obstruction ending on the mass so far in the previous slide or so far in your presentation you have not mentioned anything about the mass but here you abruptly starting to tell visible gastric peristalsis from right to left to right ending at the mass so you should have quantified regarding the mass and the inspection or you tell remove the word ending at the mass ending on the right side that is all is that so can you explain how do you elicit the visible how did you visualize the visible gastric peristalsis where did you stand what is the provoking factor of visual gastric peristalsis how do you elicit that drinking some water or some water means 10 ml water hmm? sir uh, no sir uh... so minimum of 2 to 3 tumblers of water stand on the foot end of the patient the wave of peristalsis starts along the left costal subcostal region depending on you said it is in the infra umbilical part of the greater curve is below the infra umbilical part yes. so it should be a wave which starts from the left hypochondrium coming towards the right lower abdomen and then it ascends up very typically if the stomach is not that very distended you can see a transverse progression of gastric peristalsis from the left side to the right side again there is a abrupt ending of the peristalsis with another wave forming along the fundus side towards going towards the anterior side so how many peristalsis can happen in one minute in stomach it will be 100 in a minute can it be 10 you want to make a guess guess 10 see it is usually it depends on the chronicity of the obstruction see if it is an ulcer obstruction patient may have only distended stomach they may not have a visible gastric peristalsis whereas in malignancy it is an acute obstruction patient will have gastric uh, visible gastric peristalsis usually it is 5 to 6 per minute unless patient is having vigorous peristalsis which is usually given happen after taking spicy food or after taking food in general when you give water usually you ask them to drink about 500 to 600 ml of water you can appreciate 5 to 6 peristalsis so you have to wait patiently for the peristalsis to happen all right so how did you differentiate between the gastric peristalsis and intestinal peristalsis sir so intestinal peristalsis from right to left sir okay and you also have a step ladder pattern you can see one peristalsis above second peristalsis below third peristalsis down so it can be a step ladder pattern so as you rightly said it is right to left and then it is also step ladder you can see one behind the other whereas gastric peristalsis can be only one occurring new one after the other never one below the other that is a very typical differentiating point all right then go down next go to the next slide okay right i think we have little time left what are, what are, what are the investigations you want to do to confirm the diagnosis uh, sir to confirm the diagnosis ce ct sir before that uh, x ray abdomen so okay fine how do you want to work up this patient let me ask that way that becomes easy you have done a complete hemogram yes, you have sir. done a renal parameter test you have done your electrolytes and all now okay. what will be the next test uh sir uh, radiological examination like uh usg abdomen or uh, to see so what uh, do you want to find out in the usg abdomen uh, to find any liver uh, uh, liver secondaries see, or, you uh, have a schema of answering so how do you answer is when you do an ultrasound or ct scan you have the tnm mind, in mind tnm is the staging process okay. so first information is about the t status second information is about the n status last information is about the metastatic status in t status what do you find in ultrasound 
Right. It's little okay. difficult and for the radiologist to quantify the T status because the stomach may or may not be visible. But then a well qualified radiologist taking time will be able to tell about it. So what do you know about the N status? So you can identify where are the nodes. Is there any nodes adjacent to the growth, farther to the growth, and then parotid zone and portal zone. So otherwise called stations. So what are the stations of the stomach? You do you have an idea of what are the nodal stations of the stomach? Oh. How many stations are there? Sir, so, are you with me? Uh, yes, sir. Pancreatic, splenic, uh, gastroepiploic, prepyloric nodes. Is there any numbering of nodes? Um, yes, sir. D1, D2. D1, D2 is the type of operation. You have? 16. Zone 1. Somebody answered. Very good. Starting from yeah. 1 to? 16. Japanese. Very country. good. And then you also have more than 16 nodes, but stomach is mostly 1 to 16 group of nodes. Yeah. Today, you go and read about the location of the nodes and where they are numbered. Paracardiac, then <coughs> peridiod or peri, uh, peripyloric, then comes into your 1, 2, 3, 4. It is a very schematic, easy to observe. The first few nodes are just adjacent to the stomach. Second few, second set of nodes are adjacent to the blood vessels. Right? And you also have the splenic and porta, all those things. But today, I, have, I want you to go to study. So I want to give you a diagnosis. Now you have a growth which is present in the antrum, not spread anywhere. So what, do you, what is the operation you want to do for this patient? Um, sir, uh, if it is antrum, it's a, it's a distal part of stomach, sir. So we do a distal uh, gastrectomy uh, along with a D2, uh, uh, so D2 node clear. Very good. So and, uh, D, the, what and, uh, is D1 is adjacent to the nodes. D2 is always one station beyond the significant nodes you have to dissect. That is it.